will be exploiting in the final part of my paper, uh, when I'll be suggesting that religious beliefs may inform one's norms for theory choice. Well, this concludes my discussion uh, of various limits of science. And I now move on to three. Does science call Christianity to change? Well, it has often been suggested that it should. And there seem to be two broad types of reasons behind this um, aff affirmation. And these are the two points, again, on your handout, the final two points. One reason is that science lends, is the claim that science lends no warrant to Christian faith. And secondly, that science provides the features for the Christian faith. Now, in this section, I will be exploiting what we, I hope, have learned about the limits of science by bringing that to bear on these two broad types of reasons for the central claim. As to the first claim, that science lends no warrant to Christian faith. Christian faith, as I have presented it, involves belief. Belief in God, in God's existence, in his goodness, and his unlimited power, in his being the creator of all things, in his revelation to Jesus Christ, and many things more. Clearly, science does not compel us to believe any of this, nor does it provide warrant for such beliefs. But that is nothing against those beliefs. For, as I have been arguing, there are many things we truly believe, many things we truly know, without a warrant condition for knowledge being satisfied by science. We have, I argued, extra scientific knowledge, for instance, of moral truths and of many other truths as well. And to this list, I think we uh, must add the Christian beliefs just cited. And I want to suggest that these beliefs, too, can have warrant in a way that doesn't involve uh, science or scientific research. How such beliefs can be warranted is a topic of the most exciting work in the philosophy of religion for a good deal uh, done here at this university over the last four decades. It has been argued that there are various sources of belief in God and that there are various ways in which religious beliefs can be warranted. For example, it has been argued that there is some such thing as the sensus divinitas, that in a wide variety of circumstances elicits belief in God and gives warrant to it. It had, also, it had also been argued that there is some such thing as mystical perception and that such perception warrant, warrants certain religious beliefs. And it has also been argued that there is some such thing as divine discourse, God speaking to someone in a way that provides warrant to the beliefs engendered in the person spoken to. And finally, it has been suggested in line with a long tradition that there is some such thing as divine revelation and that beliefs formed in response to that also can have warrant. The point is that the fact that science lends no warrant to religious beliefs is not much of an argument against such beliefs because there are sources of warrant other than science. Now the existence of extra scientific sources of knowledge and warrant has a number of implications. Some of the most important questions that human beings ask, I said, are ultimate questions. Still, right, and these are questions that science is unable to answer. Still, there might be knowable answers to these questions due to these extra scientific sources of religious belief and warrant. These sources might provide materials for answers or parts of answers to these questions. Questions about life's meaning these sources suggest, can be answered by saying that it lies in living in a lifing communion with God. And why the world exists, these sources seem to tell us, is that because God willed it, willed it to exist. And how we should live, these sources seem to suggest, is that it be such that we are devoted to serving and trusting God and to seek to love and serve our fellows. These answers may be warranted, even if their word, warrant doesn't derive from anything scientific. Another implication of the existence of extra scientific sources of knowledge and warrant 
is that it may encourage us to take a fresh look at brute facts. For brute facts can perhaps be explained after all, albeit by a type of explanation that is not employed in the natural sciences as we now know them. One characteristic of explanations in the natural sciences is the negative fact that they don't refer to acts and intentions of personal agents. But it seems quite obvious that many phenomena cannot be explained without such reference. To take an example from daily life, suppose I want an explanation of the puzzling fact that there's a book on my desk that I didn't put there myself. One good explanation would be that my son put it there because he wanted me to read it and have my opinion on it. The puzzling fact is, in this case, explained by reference to an act and an intention of a personal actor. This type of explanation makes no reference to universal laws, only to acts and intentions. And these explanations might therefore be called, and I'm not original in that, personal explanations. And such explanations, it seems to me, have in ordinary life, have an intuitive, have intuitively a great appeal on us. We actually can't live without them. One issue that has been raised about such personal explanations is whether they can be reduced to the sort of explanations uh, that are ubiquitous in the natural sciences that make no appeal, make no such appeal to goals and actors. I cannot, again, properly enter that matter here, but only report that by my lights, such attempts, the attempts that uh, aim to show that it can, seem are, are, are unsuccessful. Actually, there's a, there's a new book by Scott Sahan, which is called Teleological Realism, and I think he has a very good case against uh, the Davidsonian um, uh, line uh, on this problem. Now one might think that if personal explanations make sense in everyday life, they might also make sense when applied to the brute facts of the natural world I've been speaking of. This suggestion, of course, uh, will meet with suspicion. Many will object to it and say that personal explanations, if they work at all, must be confined to the ordinary life and should not be employed. Uh, with respect to uh, the brute facts that I've been uh, speaking of. But why should one grant so much? Surely many difficult issues arise, but if there really are brute facts, which means facts that cannot be explained by reference to uh, uh, a more general law, and if one furthermore thinks that personal explanations are, in a lot of contexts, perfectly good uh, explanations, and if one furthermore thinks that the extra scientific uh, sources uh, indicate that there do exist, uh, that there exist non-human agents, then the field is open to explore the possibility of personal explanations of these brute facts of a natural world. And there's a further thing I think we can learn from the limits of science. The theory choice, I said, is regulated by norms. Norms that themselves are the objects of discussion in a way, are the objects of discussion and a discussion that cannot be terminated by an appeal to science. The warrant for holding on to certain norms and not to others will thus have to derive from something other than science. But if, as I have suggested, Christian faith receives warrants from extra scientific sources, then a case could be made for the thesis that it's appropriate for Christians, for Christian theists, to include into the body of norms that guide theory choice explicitly theistic beliefs. A final note on Roman numeral two. The claim that science provides defeaters for Christian faith. Many defeaters have been proposed, of course, many defeaters having to do with history, with psychology, with 
evolutionary theory, with evolutionary psychology, with biblical criticism, and many more. Now, what light does what we have, I hope, learned about the limits of science shed on the issues of the features in general? Again, a vast topic, but in line with the character of my discussion so far, I want to offer six very general and programmatic remarks on this. When it's claimed that the sciences provide us with the features for the Christian faith, we should never, I think, forget the following six points. Not everything that's claimed in the name of science is established scientific fact. And hence, when these things are believed nonetheless, they might not amount to knowledge at all. Two, there often is quite some distance between what is scientifically established on the one hand and speculative extrapolations from what is scientifically established on the other. The chance example, uh, or the, the, the chance case by my colleague at the University of Amsterdam is a case in point. Three, there is often also quite some distance between what is scientifically established on the one hand and a worldview-driven appropriation of what is scientifically established. And I think that uh, naturalism is one a good example of a worldview, uh, as, a, as, is, uh, as an example could be. Four, when it is claimed that science provides the features for Christian belief, it would seem that what in fact provides those defeaters is not the scientifically established fact, but whatever it is that is scientifically established, in conjunction with either the speculative extrapolations or the worldview-driven appropriations that I meant uh, to refer to a moment ago. Five, neither the speculative extrapolations nor the worldview-driven appropriations seem to derive their warrant from science or from scientific research. They may have some warrant, but that's um, delivered by another source, if uh, it's delivered by another source at all. And my sixth and final very short point is that there is therefore nothing un- or anti-scientific when one rejects or is skeptical about those, skeptical, about those speculative extrapolations and worldview-driven appropriations of uh, scientific findings. <clears throat> 